Hello everyone and welcome back. I am so excited today that I have Aria Kim here. She's one of my great friends and she's gonna tell us all about her career in tech without a technical degree. So just in case you don't know who Aria is, she is a PM in the tech space and she's gonna tell us all about how she got her job without a technical degree and why she actually chose this over being a doctor and going to med school. Hi everyone, so I'm Aria. So I'm currently a cybersecurity program manager at a, one of the biggest tech companies. I've been in the cybersecurity field for around four years now, but I'm really excited to share it with you all how instead of having engineering degrees, you can still break into tech companies without having them. So before we get into all that, can you tell us what a program manager actually is? Because I know in tech, we have like product managers, yeah. project managers, program managers. What is a program manager and what does your day-to-day -day look like at work? I know there's so many different types a lot of, of PMs. PMs. <laughs> So when you hear PMs, they're just like PM equals product managers, mm -hmm. because I think that's the most well-known job titles out there. But my title, um, as Jess mentioned, is program manager. So you can think of there's ladders to it. There's first is a project manager, which like manages like one project, simply put. Program managers manages like multiple projects. They're orchestrating like a theater in a mm -hmm. sense with like different moving parts. You know, like at an orchestra, you have like violins and like, you know, different kind of instruments here like you have different departments that you're leading so on and so forth so multiple projects initiatives that you can oversee and then we have lastly the product managers which is more of a product focus as the title says we are more so seeing like what can we do to make sure we keep our customers happy like you know day-to-day -day products like iphones like how can you make sure the next iphone is reaching the customers so it's very different although the titles are very same <laughs> Yeah, I feel like when people hear PM, they assume product manager, yeah. but program manager is actually a field that I've recently learned a little bit more about. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it definitely requires a lot of soft skills yeah. because you're having to like manage a bunch of teams and keep things kind of moving. Yeah. Can you kind of tell us about some of the skills that are involved with that? Like what are the things that people should learn if they want to pursue mm -hmm. program management? Yeah, you can think of program managers heaviest job duty is being in meetings. <laughs> oh, that's scary. <laughs> I mean, but that goes same for product managers and project managers. All PMs are in a lot of meetings most of the times. Mm -hmm. But something that you have to consider after that is that you're not just participating in meetings, but you're coming up with roadmaps for specific projects. You are engaging with other team stakeholders. So for example, if you have one project, you want to talk to the engineering team, you want to talk to the data teams, like data analyst teams, like Woo! or like our stats <laughs> looking. You collect all those informations and you have to be able to communicate that effectively to leadership other teams and you're basically like the glue between all those different teams wow yeah <laughs> that sounds really complicated yeah. sounds like a lot of like you know managing stakeholders and yeah. you know circling back touching base yeah. <laughs> keeping things moving yeah how many meetings would you say you have per day on average this is gonna sound <laughs> <laughs> i'm so scared i would say anywhere between four hours to five hours a oh day. my god so most like 50 percent of your time is in meetings like, wow <laughs> okay i thought you're gonna say four to five meetings four to five hours that's a lot of meetings yeah wow okay so definitely sounds like a lot of soft skills organization yeah. taking notes planning roadmaps yeah. keeping stakeholders aligned yeah. How do you feel like AI is impacting your job? Like, do you feel like AI is eventually going to replace program managers? Where do you see that kind of going? Yeah, yeah. And I know everyone's probably seen like a lot of note taking apps or like note taking AI apps yeah. that will summarize your meeting notes for you. And a lot of the PM's role, program manager's roles is organizing notes out here. So <laughs> you might think that in the next couple of years, program managers are gonna be replaced by AI, but I mm -hmm. actually think that's completely false. Okay. Because a lot of it more has to do with actually analyzing the data our mm -hmm. data analysts give us based on the project timelines. Mm, okay. So like based on the burn rate of this previous exercise we did, the data I get from folks like Jess, Jess. <laughs> and then analyst. I have to be the one that able to make that decision or call to let other stakeholders know what's like the right path mm. moving forward. Okay. And AI not able to be at that stage yet, but I think it's important to know that we have to 
think of as a tool we can use moving forward, not、mm-hmm. uh, something that's going to replace us. Okay, so it sounds like AI can do some things, like you know, taking notes, summarizing things, but it's really about like the human decision making, like evaluating、yeah. trade offs and right, dealing、exactly. with like the relationships between teams and people.、Yeah. Are those kind of the skills you feel like keep program management from being replaced by AI? Yeah, yeah, absolutely,、mm-hmm. and you know. Think more tools get developed, and that's just only gonna make us more efficient. Yeah. You know? And who knows, ten years down the road, what's gonna happen? But yeah. Yeah. So, what AI tools are you leveraging every day in your job, and how are you using those to be more efficiently? With AI tools, Copilot. Shout out to Copilot. Yeah, Copilot. <laughs> We love Copilot. <laughs>、um, there are certain chain of actions that you can do to automate your processes to make your life so much easier. This is not a Copilot ad, by the way. <laughs>、so、But it could be Microsoft. Yeah, it could be. Please reach out. Please sponsor reach out us. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're looking at your workflow and you think of like what are the biggest pain points, like. I feel like this will make my life so much easier. One example case I can give is like, hey, if you receive a specific type of email from this team, it will send you an automated summary of what you need to do, and based、mm-hmm. on that, you already have the context of who you need to notify. That's taking the mental load of things that AI can do for you, and you can focus on actual other things, and you have the freedom to focus on other initiatives. Yeah, there's like a lot of cool things that you can mess around with that I've been personally loving. So yeah. Yeah, shout out to Copilot. Cool, cool. So, as a more non-technical person,、mm-hmm. what is it like working with technical stakeholders and being on a technical team? And what challenges have you faced with that? Yeah, good, good question. Because... I know it's probably really hard <laughs> being with like working with so many data analysts. You know, know. data analysts are kind of crazy. Tell、I、us、know. more. Yeah. <laughs> I think there is a lot of like very very honest here. I think there is a lot of hate towards PMs online. The、PMs are useless. We don't want. They're、PMs. just in meetings all day. Yeah, they don't do anything, right? So when you're the only PM in a team of engineers or data analysts, you feel like you are not part of a team because everyone's talking about technical、mm, things,、yeah. and you are just here like. Organizing everyone's asses, right? Right.、Yeah. So it is difficult at times, but that's how I show them value in the ways I can provide. Everyone has different strengths. There are not every engineer and analyst are able to communicate effectively to leadership, which I can do. So there are things that you want to provide and value and show them that you are part of a team by doing the things they can't do. You know, like those stupid. PowerPoint decks, I can make them. Look how pretty I made them. Can you do them? <laughs> exactly. And like as a data analyst, I don't want to have to make PowerPoint decks and you know、yeah. do all that communication back and forth. Because like for me, that、mm-hmm. takes a lot of like mental load. It takes a lot of time.、Yeah. Like I personally rather do more of like the technical stuff.、Mm-hmm. So I always appreciate having. I've never worked with like an actual program manager, but I've worked with like product managers、mm-hmm. and project managers,、mm-hmm. and I always appreciate those people who kind of keep things, you know, organized and everybody、yeah. on schedule. Yeah. So I think that's really awesome. Yeah, everyone has different strengths, and we just yeah we have to make a good team and. We come together, you know. Okay, so we haven't really gotten into this quite yet, but at the beginning, I mentioned how you broke into program management without having a traditional tech degree.、Mm-hmm. So, how did you break into tech without having a traditional degree? And what is your degree in? My degree is in biology. Okay, slay. Yeah, because so different from what you would typically expect from someone that's working in a tech company. My backstory is that I came to United States as an immigrant. And my parents really wanted me to become a doctor, and because they are immigrants, and I'm a first generation here, they didn't know any other ways to become successful. We have doctor, lawyer, those kind of things.、Mm-hmm. So I felt really pressured to make that decision to become a doctor, and that's why I ended up with a biology degree. But after going through COVID, working at hospitals, I realized this is like not the path for me, and I'm not going to spend grands of money, like over a hundred thousand, to be in debt with something I don't want to do.、Mm-hmm. And so I started to look into other paths of, hey, what are some things I was good at while I was in studying biology that can transfer over to tech. Industry, which I found was project management. Example number one: When I was working in labs, I was a project lab coordinator. Okay, what does that mean? It's like you are managing lab projects.、Mm. For most people, if you're putting that on the resume, you might be like manage labs X Y Z, right? But、mm-hmm. instead of doing that, I said like I led an end to end initiative of this、mm-hmm. project. So I rephrase those things to make it sound like I was managing. 
more of a project, not of like me working at a lab. Wow. So I didn't realize you were like this deep down the medical school yeah, path. Yeah. So you were actually working in labs and hospitals yeah, and then yeah. you realized like it wasn't for you. Yeah, wow. exactly. I mean, I guess it's good you realized it when you did. Was mm -hmm. there like a particular moment or like a particular day when you were like, I'm done. Like, this is not what I want to do anymore. Like, what was like that final decision like for you? To be honest, if there are any biology majors watching this, taking physics classes and then also... <laughs> also, also, being in the hospital when COVID was happening, especially in the emergency room with a lot of folks, I think I'm just not the type of person to handle that. So one day I just walked down and I said, I'm not doing this again. And oh. I'm so glad I made that decision, although it was very, very scary. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure. I mean, COVID was like a really bad time to yeah. be in the medical field anyways, mm -hmm. but it's a good thing, I guess, you realize that, you know, you didn't want to go down that path mm -hmm. and be in hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of debt. But how did your parents handle that decision? Because they wanted you to be, you know, a doctor. It's very prestigious. It makes mm -hmm. a lot of money. It's kind of like an I've made it kind of job. Yeah, yeah. So how did you navigate that with your family? I really didn't navigate it well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> they were very disappointed in my decision and we actually didn't talk for months. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Because for them, they thought they were doing what they thought was the best. Mm -hmm. But then I had a different perspective of this is my life, right? Mm -hmm. Although I appreciate you bringing over to United States for me, but I mm -hmm. want to make my own decision. Yeah. So it was a very difficult moment because I had to let them know that being a doctor is not the only way to success. Mm -hmm. There are other ways you can make money, be happy, and not be in that field. Yeah, no, I think that's hard because, you know, parents want the best for you. Yeah. They want you to be successful mm -hmm. and, you know, do like the coolest, best types of jobs. But at the end of the day, it is your life and you want to do something that you enjoy. Yeah. Are they proud of you now? Yeah, most, most of the time. time. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. So you made the decision to go from the med school path mm -hmm. into tech, and mm -hmm. you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but you said you were actually working in a lab, but you wrote resume description yeah. and made it sound like you were like managing these projects and stuff. Mm -hmm. So can you speak more about like different tips you have to break yeah. into tech if you don't have any like past experience in tech? Mm -hmm. How'd you kind of navigate selling yourself to tech companies to work there with your lab medical experience? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's really about how you tell your story. At the end of the day, there are so many transferable skills out there. It's just you have to phrase it in a specific way. As an example, when I was working in the lab, so I was on floor three and I work with floor fifth lab folks. So they're different teams, like they're different lab teammates. But instead of saying I work with other teammates, I said I worked with other stakeholders. Genius. So, you know? Yes. So that specific word change mm -hmm. now makes me look like I belong in the tech industry. Oh, that is so true. Yeah. I yeah. remember like I had my first internship as a data mm -hmm. analyst and then, mm -hmm. you know, they hired me on full time. When it came time for me to leave that job and go yeah. work other places, yeah. I was interviewing and I realized I needed to learn how to like speak the language better Yeah. because I would hear words like stakeholders and I'm like, what is a stakeholder? <laughs> like that is such a formal yeah. word. Yeah. But like, I feel like once you learn how to like talk the talk, like mm -hmm. stakeholders, collaboration, you know, circle back, I feel like it's a little easier to like, you know, yeah. get interviews and be seen. Exactly. So like that small shift of language mm -hmm. can make or break your entry to getting that interview. So if I just said like, I work with other labs, they're not going to think I'm a, someone who belongs in the tech industry because I knew how to know the language or how to talk the language. They're like, mm -hmm. okay, she knows what's going on. So we're going to interview her. Yeah. So that's how it really helped me to get that initial interview stage and then ultimately land the job. Wow, that's awesome. So what she's saying is that if you work in a different field, whether it be healthcare, education, I know people who work at warehouses or at mm -hmm. Walmart, it doesn't matter where you work, but it's all about the way you sell yourself, the way you use your transferable skills, mm -hmm. the way you communicate your value and like speak the corporate language language, those things are what's going to really matter at the most. Yeah. So now that you're a few years into your career, mm -hmm. what does your career look like now? Where's it going? Do you have a side gig? Yeah, I'm working now as a cybersecurity program manager 
and I am actually loving my career, but I also do have a little side hustle. It's called Tech with Aria on Instagram, and that's where I educate people on how to break into tech coming from a non-linear background or non-traditional background. I think there's a lot of folks out there who had a degree in something they don't do now, and I want to make sure I want to tell my story and then reach other folks that may be experiencing the same thing because I really also wish I found someone like me on the internet For saying sure. that it's okay to pivot, it's okay to change your career when I was in that situation years ago. That's awesome. So what is your like primary motivation for having a side hustle? Money. <laughs> no, I'm, sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Fair, good answer, good answer. She meant to say to help people. <laughs> I'm yeah, no. It, all jokes aside, I love receiving messages from people where they said, hey, your advice has genuinely helped me. Now I work in the tech industry. I used to work as a server, but now mm. I'm in a tech company or Amazing. now I pivot into something else. It makes me so happy. And that feeling is something I want to continue to receive and help others. Aw, and the money, because let's be real. <laughs> in this economy, <laughs> we got to have a side hustle. Yeah, let's all like, yeah. <laughs> That's super inspiring. Just hearing about how you got your first tech job, mm -hmm. why you decided not to pursue the medical field, and your amazing side hustle. Where can people find you if they want to stay in touch or reach out? Yes, search me Aria Kim on LinkedIn or Tech with Aria on Instagram and TikTok and YouTube. Oh. <laughs> She's everywhere. You can't miss her. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here and sharing your story. And y'all, drop some questions and comments down below. Bye. Bye.